Hello and welcome to Keep Right On, a Birmingham City podcast brought to you by us here at Birmingham Live. I'm Brian Dick. Um, Alex Dickin has gone to lie down in a darkened room. Um, so I'm joined by our our prominent blues blogger, reporter, writer, Ryan Deeney, who's got some of the best insights on social media about blues, um, and also by a colleague of mine at Birmingham Live, Joe Chapman. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello, Brian. Lovely to join you today. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll press right on with this, I think. There is uh, no beating about the bush. Birmingham City enter the uh, the international break in 21st place one one place above the relegation zone tied on points with Huddersfield only out of the bottom three on courtesy of goal difference which is two goals better than Huddersfield's interestingly both clubs have both scored 42 goals but somehow there's a a couple of teams in the league have worse defensive records than Blues at the moment, and thankfully that's what's keeping Blues head of heads afloat at this stage. If the season wants to end now, that's absolutely fine by me. I'm happy to forego these next eight games. Uh, so we go into this uh, this today's podcast um, on the back of a one nil def- home defeat to Watford, the fifth loss in the six games since Mark Venus stepped up uh, in Tony Mowbray's absence. I'm going to probably preempt a little bit and say there was it wasn't as bad as Tuesday night, so that's that's one positive. Uh, but there was still plenty of things to grumble and talk about. So let's take a positive from 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 Saturday, Ryan. Uh, they at least had some fight, didn't they? Which we didn't see in midweek. Yeah, it was the type of performance that. If you were losing games to perform a lot that most weeks, you'd just kind of sit there and think something is coming, something's going to happen. Um, it was just, I had a strange sort of feeling um, after Saturday where I felt like I, I can't decide what the feeling was about, but I felt quite calm and quite relaxed after Saturday. And I don't know if that was a, I had no expectation before the game, and then all of a sudden the game wasn't a surprise, it was so in fight and Playing that way we did, playing with the confidence and everything else was a positive. And I'm also, yeah, I, I don't know if the actual positivity of the performance will make me feel a lot we're actually going to move somewhere, we're going to step forward, we're going to give these last, is it eight, nine games a good go? I'd say games, isn't it? Yeah, eight games. Yeah. We're actually going to give this a go and put everything on the line. And if it isn't good enough, it isn't good enough. I think it's just a case of, uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll see what happens now. Um, but I've, I've, the performance was strong enough to make me sort of believe that, you know, there is something there and something will turn eventually. I mean, you can't have that many chances and have that much territory without scoring a goal for the rest of the season. It's just not going to happen. But that performance has to carry on now. Yeah, I've got to say, after after Tuesday night, I was looking at the nine games and going, yeah, there's winnable games there, but they're not winnable if if Blues are going to play like they did in the first half of Tuesday night. Thankfully, it was better, and thankfully, there was a heartbeat. Um, so, yeah, it's... I, I would say now I can see Blues picking up points from the last nine games, as, or eight games, sorry, as long as they recreate that, as, as, as Ryan said. Um. Joe, can you give us a cause from a cause for hope for for Blues, please? I'm begging you. I think the we've had this conversation quite recently, Brian. I think there's an irony to this situation because it's a similar scenario that Blues have found themselves in for what the last ten years or so, at varying points. But we've always talked, uh, and I've got plenty of family members that are Blues fans, Blue season ticket holders who very often seen teams come to St Andrews over the course of the last however many years and Blues have been workmanlike, um, you know, can be direct off and get the job done when they need to, but there have been lots of good footballing teams in the Championship and the footballing teams in the Championship are, are increasing by number. Uh, Blues look to be in that position now where they've got some really, really nice footballers um, and, and the, the the question might you might have is, are they, are they too nice? A, a football team in general, uh, that core of you know, rightly or wrongly, whether you thought about a Craig Garner, Troy Deeney, Harley Dean, 
is there enough kind of almost nastiness on the pitch nowadays um, when they do go behind to kind of drag everybody else up for all the creative talent that they have in the squad to, you know, just muster something just when they need it? Because you have to say this week particularly, Middlesbrough, Watford ought to be the perfect sort of fodder in terms of opposition. They're neither fighting for promotion, fighting for relegation. Their seasons are over, really. Um, you do kind of think if you can't beat these teams at home, where are the points coming from? Because, you know, when you do go and play QPR, you know what that place is going to be like in a, in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, the, we'll, we'll come on to the running, actually. There are some some quite interesting fixtures. And, and uh, one of the takes from, uh, from our contributors is also regard, regarding what Sheffield Wednesday and Huddersfield have, have got coming down the line as well. So we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, Ryan, when we were in the uh, in the WhatsApp group discussing what we might be talking about today, you wanted to talk about team selection and substitutions. Um, let's let's start with team selection. Am I right in thinking the Dion Sanderson uh, omission stuck out like a sore thumb? It did initially, but it wasn't that I thought it was a bad thing. I think it just stuck out like a sore thumb because when we got to Millwall and Mark Roberts was thrown straight back into the fray despite clearly not being 100% fit. Um, we just kind of expected, right, we've got a second centre half, we're just going to throw him back in and just hope that he brings us over the line. So to play Buchanan at centre half, I think the surprise for me was actually more just drama playing left back rather than Laird, to be fun, to be honest. Right. But I think um, Buchanan playing centre half and actually being given that license alongside Iwu to, you know, just defend on the ground rather than maybe um us trying to find a solution to area balls that may or may not come. I thought was a fairly bold move and yet Buchanan's kind of stepped in there three or four times now and he's never let us down. He's actually probably been since he returned to the team, he's probably been our best player. Um since that weird situation when Gary Gardner came on at right back and Buchanan got left on the bench. Um, yeah. And he's stepped back in and probably been our best player. And I think the one thing I've noticed with him is Mowbray mentioned early on, didn't he, about Buchanan maybe not playing down the line quick enough or not playing forward, taking the easy option. He's actually come back and he's not just doing that job himself, but actually driving other people on and demanding more of them, demanding that other players actually play the ball forward and, you know, have some bravery about them, which I think is. I suppose, in a way, you're probably looking at someone who potentially becomes a future leader. Obviously, still a young mm. lad at the moment, isn't there? He um, is. Sorry, Bob. No, I was just going to say, I think my one thing with um, Sanderson at the moment is, I think a lot of people are looking at him as, because he was given the club captaincy at the start of the season, I think a lot of people are now looking at him and expecting him to be, come back and be this big, roaring, loud leader, you know, the next Harley Dean, next Troy Dean, and that sort of big, figure and presence on the pitch that you kind of look to and go well it's on you now and we probably need to just be a little bit careful with regards to the fact that he's still 24 years of age he's only past 100 um league appearances this season it was quite clear in the summer that after the loss of troy you lost friend you lost um dean colin you've lost a lot of experience in there so then you know you're going to lose the likes of ruddy gardner Djokovic, Long and a lot of those other players probably the end of this season it seemed well to me anyway it looked as if Sanderson was almost being primed as look team captain this season you're going to be you're a big personality beyond the scenes players seem to like you you get on with the fans we're going to groom you to be you know the next leader of this club once we start moving forward and Djokovic was given the club captaincy almost to take those like ambassadorial roles off him so you could just focus on being, you know, wearing the armband on the pitch and sort of growing into it. Once we made the managerial change, obviously all that goes out of the window, doesn't it? It's yeah, it's a completely different scenario. All of a sudden, he sort of stood out on his own with the armband, and everybody's looking for somebody else to step up. Yes, you want the guy wearing the armband to step up, but I think we've still got to be mindful that he's still a young man himself and still trying to find his way into you know a completely brand new territory like everybody else. So I think we just need to be mindful of sort of looking to him and going, you're our captain, you should be on the pitch and you should be doing this when the scenario after he was given the captaincy has completely changed to when he was actually given it. Yeah, indeed. Maybe a, a captain for the future in a stable situation 
but yeah. not yet ready not yet ready to be that leader when everything is sort of up in the air around him yeah in, interesting point i as regards to team selection i was quite surprised not to see duke on uh, in the side um and i came out last week and said oh you know i'm afraid we're back we're back to the uh the 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 mike england lump it forward to the big the big man mike bassett sorry lump it forward to the to, to the big man time of year and i still feel that i i still feel i'd like to see that although although obviously Duke has now got some sort of injury we don't know the seriousness of that yet um but yeah, I, I I was hoping to see Duke inside. I think largely because St- Paul Stansfield would look so isolated against Middlesbrough, uh, and 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 just almost uncontactable, almost off grid, you know, in in terms of playing against three centre backs. Uh, and I felt he needed some support. And and I think one of the takes later is, is about the role that Stans- Stansfield's best role, which we'll come to. So yeah, I wanted to see Duke in there. It didn't happen. And I think just as, a, as an overall point of view, I've, I have this as one of my maxims, is that uh, when players start being put into, in, played out of position, that's a red flag for me. Um, and I think there's there's a couple of players in the Blues Blues team at the moment who aren't playing in, in, in the right positions. You also mentioned, Ryan, substitutions. Uh, now, just for a quick recap, um, uh, Tyler Robertson, Lucas Djukovic came on after 72 minutes for Koji Miyoshi and Jordan James. Then George Hall and Gary Gardner um, came on in, on 83 minutes for Ivan Sunic and Ethan Laird. And uh, there was that enforced change at the end with Scott Hogan coming on for Duke. Which of those um, uh, stewed your fruit, Ryan? It, it, it was just... It, I'm, I'm wary of tackling the individuals here because I don't think they're the ones that the players that have come onto the pitch I don't think they're the ones that sort of deserve any kind of criticism or anything like that they've been given a role and they've just sort of been thrown on there to do that role at the time we were so on top of that game and you've got Miyoshi dropping in from the right hand side you've got Laird constantly overlapping him um if you're going to make a change it was probably just to get another body in the box and maybe move Bakuda into a wide position whether that was taking Pike, Sonic or JJ off. I mean, it could have been either or. Um, so the Djokovic substitution made sense. I think Robert's playing right wing, he looked like a fish out of water. Um, whereas Miyoshi was running about, floating here, there and everywhere. You've brought on someone who's a little less mobile. Um, not as confident, sort of dropping in and taking the ball on his left foot and stepping inside and playing forward pass into the feet of the forwards. So you've lost a little bit there when you've done so well building down that right hand side and then to bring on i mean i, I don't know what the answer the question is that gary gardner answers anymore i just i don't um and with regards to george hall coming on at right back it just seemed like you were just throwing him on just to throw him onto the pitch <laughs> um you, you just throw him once, throw him onto the pitch, and just hope you've got a bit of pace and directness. You're not doing any. You're not. He just looked lost. He come on a right back, and he just looked lost. He was sort of even the, the defensive work. He was sort of. He didn't know whether to go, whether to stay, when to run. So you've made three substitutions. You've got three players that are well, two players that are definitely out of position down the right hand side, which has been such a key part of your game all, you know, all game because Watford's left hand side was a weak area. Mm. And then you've got yeah Gary Gardner's come on, Djokovic has come on. We haven't actually got anybody to really put the ball into the box for Djokovic, and it just it just became a mess. And yeah. we had a couple of set pieces, we had a couple of half chances, but we never really built anything after those changes were made. And it just it goes back to yeah again question the sort of management of the game and maybe but do we have that game understanding that smell on the sidelines to you know understand exactly what the game needs at that moment, or are we just putting players onto the pitch and thinking hopefully you'll just get us something yeah I did certainly not the first instance where where you've ended up with a blues 11 at the end of a match and you're thinking what have they tried to do there you, you know you made reference to the Gary Gardner appearing at, at right back you, you know there there is a tendency to to to, to throw all the creatives on and and as, as you chase the game listen I know it worked for Man United yesterday um but you know, against Liverpool in, in in the FA Cup, but you you know you're talking about players that really technically 
fantastic players that really can influence a game. Uh, you know, the, the shape went. It was a knockout, a knockout competition for United. But yes, the, you know, on Saturday, Blues were. You still got to have that structure, haven't you? You still got to know what know what you're tr you're trying to achieve. Um, Joe, I, I've written. I've want, want to come to you now about the the run in. Um, Blues have got eight games. Uh, QPR away, Preston at home, Leicester away, uh, Cardiff at home, Coventry at home, Rotherham away, Huddersfield away, both of which look like huge games, and finishing up at. Uh, at home to Norwich. What what does that what does that run in look like to you, Matt? Uh, well, I think it's relatively kind. I, I, you take Leicester out of it, who it, remarkably are all, almost dropped back into the playoff places now. Um, it's otherwise a, a, a pretty decent one. Coventry, you'd think, will have a bit to play for. I'm not ex sure exactly when the dates fall for. Uh, the FA Cup semi-final, there's a possibility that that might impact their team selection around that time, possibly. I don't know. Norwich, you'd think, will possibly still have something to play for on the last day. They might still have to win to book a top six spot. Um, other than that, I'd say it's, 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 a fairly, it's a fairly inviting one, on paper anyway. Rotherham, you'd think, with three games to play, will be relegated. Uh, Cardiff, a little bit like Watford and Middlesbrough aren't going anywhere. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say Preston have a more than an outside chance of, of making the top six at this point as well. Huddersfield looks a, a, a huge game at the end of April. Um, you take every game, obviously, the the, the, the next one is the more, the more important of, of, of any of the above because the fact that it is the next one and it comes against a direct uh, rival. So I think they could have it a lot worse. Um, I can't say that I'm fully versed in exactly what those other sides down there are, are, are alike at the moment in terms of their runnings. Um, I've seen extended highlights of, of a few sides this weekend. I mean, Plymouth haven't had the rub of the green uh, against Preston and they've, they've really struggled recently under a new manager. Stoke managed to post a win last week and then have fallen back into some similar habits uh, against Norwich. They look, you know, particularly poor at home. You're all, you, it's getting to that point in the season now where Blues can really uh, you know, it's it's very much within their hands, and if they can post, say, four points over the Easter period, um, the picture can change so dramatically. I mean, we saw that, we've seen that already with you know the teams like the like QPR at the moment that have picked up results recently. I do think Sheffield Wednesday will flatline a little bit. That's my prediction now because they've given so much just to get back into this race that I'm wondering now whether they can muster up enough in the last seven or eight matches of their season to to really reach, you know, the thick end of 50 points. So um, what you kind of hope for with the swings and roundabouts of the championship is that Blues are hitting a rut um, with still plenty of, of time and points left to play for um, in which they can reverse their own situation. That That's what you're, you're hoping for. And of course, as I know we'll discuss anyway, the return of Tony Murray can't come soon enough. I don't think expected uh, the impact, the negative impact that his absence on the sidelines has, has had on Blues. No, I think that's, that's very fair to say, uh, which is going to very neatly, Joe, lead us on, on to, some, to our takes from, from fans. Great to see so many. Um, really does help. Uh, produce content and keep us in touch with what you guys are thinking. John Merrill, a uh, regular uh, correspondent on social media, has come straight to the number of it. His take is that the manager situation needs clarifying. Is Mowbray, if Mowbray's back after the international break, then great. However, we cannot be going to QPR with Venus being the main man. It simply has to change. Plus, that's not knocking Venus as he's the assistant step, stepping in. It it. It does come to this, and again, I don't really know what to say. If if I'm honest, it, it it's just it, it's a a really, really, really unfortunate situation. Uh, I'm not going to sort of give any oxygen of publicity to some some of the, uh, the conspiracy theories that have been put out there about you know who knew what when, um, because I'm very mindful of the fact, and I want to be respectful to Mowbray. Uh, that we, you know, we're dealing with a, an individual's private medical information here as well. But I suppose to take take a, a talking point out of what John said is: Are we in a world, Ryan, where now 
some serious thought needs to be given to an interim. Nothing there. Um, I appreciate the sort of severity of the situation, but I think if we if it gets clarified that Mowbray's going to be gone for the season and he won't return at all, then there might be a discussion to be had. But if Mowbray's improving, getting better, he's in communication with Venus all the time, according to Venus. Um, performances have been up and down, which to be fair, they've been up and down all season. Um, I just don't see a situation where anybody benefits from us bringing in an interim manager for two, three, four games. It just, it, it doesn't seem like that sort of situation to me. It's the hand we've been dealt. It's on the current management team and the players to get out of it. End of the day, we shouldn't have been in this position anyway. We all know that we shouldn't have been in this position. If we do go down, it's not going to be because Mark, we didn't bring in an interim manager for five, six games. No one was really calling for an interim manager at the point that Mowbray was you know, taken in and sort of removed. It's only because results have dropped, which means we're going to spark more panic by bringing somebody else in anyway. That they come in and then completely change the whole identity of the team just for it to change back after three games. It It's all just too messy and too panicky and... I just don't see a situation where, you know, we should be making that change now. I think the players know what the job, jobs are and, you know, it's on management and players to make sure that we get those results now. Yeah, I'm not convinced it's all about bringing a talismanic figure in. I, I, as, as I say, I think the key thing is, is do do players have clarity on what they're being asked to do? And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's lump it forward to the big man. You, If you want to play your way out, then you can give that a go. It's about clarity on, on the field. Um, you don't need. I'm, I'm not sure how adding another voice brings that clarity. I think I've probably just paraphrased what you said there, Ryan. But um, yeah, not not for me either. Uh, we've got a comment here from Reg saying, "If we don't have Tony Mowbray back after the break, I fear it's all over." It may seem insensitive, but needs must. If he's not going to be fit to carry on his role, we must get a manager in to give us any chance. Gary Rower would be my choice. Um, Joe, from the outside looking in, what 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 are your thoughts about an, an eight game interim manager in this situation? I think it's a really strong point that Ryan's made there. Um, it it could actually just muddy the waters even more than they already are. Um, it, it it would be panicky, but it is kind of panic stations at the moment. At the same time, and you kind of think, well. If you go to QPR, if you go to the Preston game at St Andrews next time out, and um, and, and Mark Venus, who is unfortunately been put in this position that he certainly didn't ask for, um, is, is having to take the reins still. Um, there are crumbs of comfort, I, am, I, I suppose, in, in the in the sense that the performance was improved on Saturday, but um, ultimately the results have stayed the same. And so, the one thing you would have to consider more than anything is 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 Mowbray himself. I mean, there's somebody who's still in very constant communication with the, with the, with the management team. Um, would he give his blessing for it? You know, it's, it's his project. It's his baby, you know, uh, that, he, that he's not been able to, you know, be there at this moment in time for. So in that case, you know, would that shorten the shortlist even further of people that Mowbray would approve of? Um, would Gary Cook and Tom Wagner even entertain it? you know, a fourth, fifth, if you count Steve Spooner, a sixth for different person in the dugout this season. I mean, that, that would be absolutely remarkable. Um, it's obviously worked before in the sense that Harry Redknapp had a, a minimal amount of time to, to get results, but that was a diff very different scenario. So uh, I, th I think I would probably edge towards agreeing with Ryan. I, I think it would just be a little bit too panicky. Um uh, and and you do you do just we all just I, I I guess just hope and pray that that Tony's back as soon as possible. It's not like he's got a hamstring injury. You, there's no kind of you know time period where you can say well he he'll be back he'll be back this week or if not maybe maybe next week at a push. It's it's some it's something where you just hope you've got a little bit more clarity over this over this uh, international break and then mm. th even if it's not the Easter period, there are still six very big games after that as well. Um, and Blues aren't you know, as as bad as the situation feels at the moment, they're not three, four points adrift either. So, you know, I think you you probably just have to kind of take this game, this, this Easter period as it comes and, and see what it looks like on the other side. 
I don't know how Tony Mowbray has a conversation with Mark Venus, his assistant of 20 years, to say, look, I want to bring someone in over you. You know, and uh, yeah, I, I know we're talking about the future of Birmingham, C Birmingham City Football Club, but whatever happens in my mind, Tony Mowbray is a key player in that future. Whatever happens, um, it's probably worth mentioning as well that relegation, although it will be embarrassing and disastrous from a sporting point of view, it's not the disaster it would have been three, four years ago, where we're looking at you know financial difficulties and you know administration, all the rest of it. it it's just going to be a bump in what will hopefully be a long and successful journey under Tom Wagner and you know the current ownership. So I don't think we need to panic so much in that respect either. It's it, it would just be embarrassing because of the decisions that were made early on in the season by the people in charge of our football department and you know, a little bit of misfortune with regards to Moby's illness. It's it's not existential, Ryan, but I have absolutely no appetite to be going down into League One but, <laughs> but because it you know it's it's not the it's not the tour of seaside seaside venues and market towns that it may maybe people some people think it is. You've got clubs like Portsmouth that, that have been down there for years and years and years. Derby County are, are struggling to get out of it. Um you know it, it took Ipswich time time to get out. There are there are absolutely no guarantees that if, just because Birmingham City are probably bigger than most of the other clubs down there. That they don't go and get their noses bloodied by Stevenage or Fleetwood, or you know, and have to play in the, in the whatever the Papa John's is now called. I I have no appetite for to to be to be doing that, even if it means Blues win every other week or every week and win the majority of the home games. Not for me, thank you. I completely agree. I just I, I don't think relegation is the complete disaster that it was previously. And I think we should probably, mm. if we're going to run and sort of. You know, do a lot of the panic and stuff like that. We need to just take a deep breath and go. If it happens, it happens. We'll deal with it, and hopefully, we'll you know get better and stronger in the long run. As you know, hopefully, if we stay up this season, as you know, we probably still should. Again, we'll look to this season and go. That was a disaster. Can't happen again. We move forward. Yeah. Okay, Alex Hans uh, has given us a take. He said, this year feels different to previous years. It feels like the post-COVID clotet season, um, which basically withered on the vine and, and, and Blues basically had, had one draw with Charlton, I think, to, to, to stay in, in the league. Um, Alex says, this time other sides are picking up points, um, which they didn't back in that coat, in that, in that, COVID interrupted season. Don't see the rut ending anytime soon without the return of Tony Mowbray, who cannot be rushed. Um, does it feel like the po the, the the clot out sitch season? Um, I mean, we had Jude then, didn't we? Uh, I'd, I'd that, that, was, that was a bad time, bro. That was a bad time. I remember <laughs> watching the Albion Blues game, uh, the first game back during oh, the post COVID yeah. year. That was uh, they were all playing like they had like you know a few points in the pub. It was like you, you you know they were just so far off it as we probably should have expected. But I remember I remember Pep leaving not too long after that, and um, and again a little bit like the Venus situation at the moment. Steve Spooner was put in a position where he didn't want to be in, that didn't didn't necessarily have to be in. Was asked to go and lead the team, and it was a miserable end to the season, wasn't it? Um, they really really struggled. It was awful. The um, the the trip away to Stoke. Uh, with, with um, was it Wes Harding and Nico Gordon playing left sided centre half and left wing back? That uh, 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 was as as terrifying a, uh, a, a forty minutes as I think I've ever ever seen Blues Blues come up with. Yeah, it it, it wasn't fun. Difficult. Uh, I mean, I, I'm struggling, Alex, to a to remember because because my memory is failing me, but b to sort of think that the anything's like the COVID, se the COVID season. It was just so bizarre and, and unprecedented. Um, but I, I, I do echo that the return of Tony Mowbray does feel very, very, very crucial. Um, I'm not how to sh you're sure how to say this guy's Twitter handle. Uh, I'm going to peer in here. Um, lad. Um, um, he says, encouraged by Saturday. Uh, when compared to the awful Borough match, yeah, I think I think we're all there with you on that one. Um, chances created again give some hope. Looking at Huddersfield and Sheffield Wednesday's fixtures, can see us and them being split by goal difference by five pm on fourth of May. Do you think it? Do we think it's going to be that close? Uh, 
our, our blues going to put some blue water between themselves and, and the bottom three, or, or are we in for a final day? Um, roller coaster, white knuckle, whatever cliche you want to choose. Hopefully, we can just have a good laugh, leave it to the final day, have 10 teams all battling out for survival on the final day, and then we get the win and finish somewhere off 15th, and it all looks rosy. <laughs> It's okay. impossible to say, isn't it? I mean, it is. yeah. as Joe sort of alluded to earlier, you know, you've got Plymouth. I know there's real sort of bad vibes there with um, Ian Foster. John Eustace, he's probably never going to win a game, but never lose a game either. I think they've drawn seven of the last nine or something. Um, so Sheffield Wednesday, they've pushed so much energy into getting this far. Are they going to keep it up? Huddersfield, we don't know what they're going to be like under the new manager. Drawing away at Rotherham is, you know, that's probably the three points you're looking at, isn't it? So it's impossible to say at the moment. I think we're just guessing, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, we are. I mean, I, I could list here the, the 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 eight fixtures. I have noted them that Huddersfield and, and Wednesday have got. It's it's just going to sound like a random um, uh, list of fixtures, really. Uh, so I, I'm probably not going to do that. Um, I would say just looking at Sh- uh, Sheffield Wednesday's run in. Um, They've got Stoke at home. They've got Blackburn. They've got Sunderland on the on the final day. They've got Swansea at home. I do see points there, and I, and I know we're we're hoping that they've they've blown a gasket with that massive defeat at Ipswich. Uh, maybe I've been spending too much time with Danny Roll uh, with with Alex Dickin, Dan, the the president of the Danny Roll fan club. Um, I th- yeah, I'm not ready to write Wednesday off. Um, Huddersfield. They've got cute. They've got Carve, which will be difficult. Um, Stoke away, Millwall, Swansea at home, Blues obviously. So I, I, basically, I think to sum it up is they've all got matches that they think they, they they could well win and get themselves out of it. And you know, even even if we if we just look at the look at the form form book and 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 run a simulation of these matches, this is the championship. So we're too far out to to, to make anything meaningful, many meaningful prognostications, aren't we, Joe? Yeah, I think so. Do you think this is as big a relegation battle during your time watching Covering Blues, Brian, as regards to the pure number of teams that are involved that could still go down? Because they've all got genuine chances. You can make a case for Plymouth. You can make a case for Stoke. You can make a case for Millwall, Sheffield Wednesday, QPR. I mean, you go all the way down and you think any of these could go. And I don't know, like Blues have maybe relied on two or three teams being poorer than them in any given season over the last 10 years, they yeah. could end up finishing still about 15th or 16th and, 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 and looking relatively comfortable on, on, in, on paper by the end of the season, if, if it pans out that way, if it pans out the way we all want it to. Uh, it, Sorry, go on. No, no, but I was just going to add, I, I think, you know, if, if you consider that Blues are playing, they've still got a number of teams down there as well. They, they've got to play QPR, they've got to play Huddersfield, they've got to play... Um, Sheffield Wednesday and Rotherham as well. Uh, they could do a hell of a lot of damage to other teams as well as as well as well putting themselves in a much better light. Yeah, they, they could. I Is it is it different? Uh, I think it feels different for two reasons. It feels different because of the number of other clubs that are down there, just looking at the league table at the moment. Um, I think Millwall are 16th and 43 points probably just about got enough now. But I would take 17th Blackburn. Blues are three points behind Blackburn. 17th. So we've got Blackburn, Plymouth, Stoke, QPR, Blues, and then the three in the relegation zone. It feels different because there are so many um, still down there. It also feels different because we haven't got the back to basics, boys. You know, we haven't, we, I've said this before, we haven't got the Harley Deans, we haven't got the Michael Morrisons, don't, may not have the Dukes now. And, uh, you know, the, the, the real battlers so of Blues are going to have to extricate themselves for this by playing a little bit of, of football. Brian? Yeah. It just, we're just going to have to play our way out. I think the only thing we can do now, really, is just concentrate on ourselves. And I know that's a bit cliche and a bit boring, but there are so many different teams down there and so many different, you know, ways that this could all turn out. Teams are going to be, you know, teams that they really shouldn't be beating. And all you can do is just make sure you pick up the points yourself. I think if we get three wins now, it's probably going to be enough. I know people were talking about record points to stay up at one stage, but the idea that, you know, 10 or so sides were going to pick up, um, you know, a point per game for the rest of the season was always unlikely to be the case. 
So I think all we can do is just focus on what we're doing, hopefully start putting the ball in the back of the net once or twice. And uh, yeah, I, I think if we could pick up a point per game the yeah, rest of the season, now uh, that puts us on 47. Mm. Uh, I think that'll probably be enough to keep us up. Interesting link again there, uh, Ryan. Steve Poole has said, at the moment, we're averaging about 15% of total shots on target. If this improves, even by 5 or 10%, results will improve. Yeah, the... Um, the uh, the the chance conversion rate is not good at the moment, and and you know every, every Mark Venus interview seems to be talking about needing better quality, and that was certainly the case the case on on Saturday. So yeah, in, you are right. More shots on targets clearly clearly means more goals, and I don't think Blues really massively worked Daniel Backman at the, at the weekend, which brings us to our questions. Um, Mikey H01, a regular contributor. Uh, your thoughts on playing JJ wide left? Um, we really miss Dembele out there with his pace and goals. I get playing J JJ if it's long long gallo at left back, uh, but Drame can defend. Dembele is more important going forwards, and teams are scared of him. We need him back when fit. So, what to do about the left midfield, stroke left wing, stroke left back, or the the left flank of Birmingham City's team? I think, I suppose the one thing to note here is Dembele and Anderson were playing on the left wing in a very different system. Although it was the same, pretty much the same shape, that sort of 4-2-3, 1-4-4-2 shape, I think it's a very different system whereby Dembele and Anderson were relied upon to go 1v1 with people, would build down the right-hand side, sort of shepherd the ball out towards those guys. Um, whereas now, it's very much sort of a narrow almost a bit more of a narrow 4-4-2 where the wingers have got more license to drift in field and I'm not sure that Dembele and well, I suppose we haven't really seen Anderson involved in this sort of team have we um he's been weirdly sort of disappeared and sort of come back and then disappeared again um but I think it's a very different role to the one that Dembele, Dembele and Anderson plan to start the season um I've got to be honest, I don't really know the answer I don't think it's a case of I mean we've seen at times like the goal against uh, Ipswich where Twan Zeebe got around the back. So obviously you need that defensive assurance there. And there were a couple of times the following game, what well, with the game after, where JJ was left wing and you could see him regularly get back into position, push Laird to watch the overlap so he could watch the guy coming inside. Um, so there's clearly a relationship there. I think the other thing as well is just, it's been a way of getting JJ into the side because he's probably our biggest goal threat now. Um, when we are playing our football and are getting the ball into the box, he's got a lovely little knack of getting in on the back post or finding himself in the area to get on the end of things and i think that's something that if you take jj out do you then lose that i i don't really know the answer at the moment the whole team just feels a little bit imbalanced while we're trying to play this new style and it's i, I don't know I, I don't really know the answer i mean we haven't really got a left footed player out on the left hand side but then the wingers aren't going to resolve that either so the the very little sort of natural balance there and we're trying to put pieces in make sure we can try and play the quality of football even if we don't have the maybe players in what you'd assume would be their correct roles yeah i don't i don't think left wing left wingers are left footed anymore are they they tend to be right footed now so uh, it goes back to me this one about playing people in roles that, that are actually their positions I, I understand what you're saying about jj being the goal threat i, I just I want I want someone with pace and who can go outside a man um, to be playing in that advanced left hand role uh, and and you know if you if you are going to play the four two three one JJ could be the double pivot and I'm going to contradict myself here by saying that's not his natural position position but it's more of his natural position in the middle than it than it is on on the left and you can release him forward even if he's if he's playing nominally as a as a as a a defensive central midfielder there are enough i mean stansfield can play off the left um you know miyoshi can play off off off, off the left although I, I know he's not a, a massive fan of, of doing that role joe what are your thoughts about someone like dembele a an excellent attacker who is mm. dis defensively suspect yeah that's what? always been a a, a, a big issue I would have with Dembele. I think he's very he can be very, very exciting to watch as a footballer. We've seen 
the goal threat, the the, the finishing ability. Um, I'm watching the the game at Blackburn earlier in the season where he scored a couple and could have really realistically, realistically had about four that night. You know, he, he's no doubt a, a very very talented forward. Um, exactly what Ryan's already alluded to at Ipswich recently. It was a goal that came because of, of a, a, a switch off, um, you know, the, the failure to track back or a failure to, to, to keep an eye on, on the runner. And, um, and the Ipswich goal came about, I know it was relentless anyway at the moment, but um, I think just generally it feels like a bit of a mishmash and it's not, they've, it's not entirely the fault of everybody uh, concerned. I mean, they've had a, plenty of bad luck. I mean, you know, how useful has Christian Bielik been uh, and how much of a miss has he been recently? And, um, Anderson's an interesting one actually because I thought he started the season uh, pretty well and looked quite useful and no, he maybe wasn't producing in the final third in terms of goals and assists but I thought he, he looked somebody who was quite versatile that could play in different positions um, but again, you know, he's somebody who has not played a hell of a lot of football in the last three or four months so uh, yeah, it just it feels at the moment like there's so many square pegs in round holes for one reason or another we we talked off air about Kevin Long and, and Kevin Long leaving the club um, earlier in the year. And again, that f- for someone like Kevin Long, you can't begrudge him that move. It, it is a life-changing move, uh, a different lifestyle, different challenge at the end of his career. But that said, it doesn't help Blue's cause at this moment in time because he'd come in and actually brought a little bit of stability. Players like Anderson and, and Kevin Long aren't going to be part of the Tony Mowbray long-term plan. But for here and now... I think you could have potentially found positions for them in, in, in this squad, in this matchday squad. Yeah, we're, we're told that Anderson and Dembele of, of injuries, hopefully they'll be available again after the uh, after the international break. Uh, I took the unusual uh, route of splitting, I'm going to struggle with his name again, Omzi Lad's t- um, tweet into two sections. The second section of, of his uh uh, of his of his correspondence was could Tyler Roberts do a job up front as the target man if Duke's out? What, what, what do you think about that? I I'm, I'd have to say I would not be against that seeing Roberts play up front. I think this all goes back to probably similar que- things that we've just run through. I think when you look at the squad as a whole, I mean, I'm I'm weary on the long situation where Bob with Bielik now being a centre half, we've got four centre-halves, so it's a little bit of misfortune that we found ourselves in the position we're in, but we've got four centre-halves that should be able to be available and cover and step up when we need them. Plus, Boo Cannon and Drama have also stepped in there when needs, but he should have enough to deal with it, and management should have the ability to you know, find the right selection from the bodies available. I think with regards to the attack, it all just feels a little... If we're saying that Tyler Robertson and Stansfield weren't signed to play as strikers, then the only strikers we've got are Scott Hogan and Lucas Djukovic, neither of whom are really in favour as far as starting goes with uh, Mowbray or Venus. And probably have to be all phase on. So that probably then comes back to recruitment and what we did in the summer and what we did in January. Um I suppose we've got two left wingers, but again, Dembele hasn't played, Anderson hasn't played when fit, so we've kind of found an alternative option there. So we've got a lot of different options, but Moby's kind of having to be creative with what fits an actual structure. I don't know whether Tyler Roberts is the person to play up front. I thought him and Stansfield looked okay together. But I'm not sure Roberts is a natural striker. I think he's somebody a little bit like Stansfield who wants to drop off, get on the half turn play, make things happen, rather than maybe standing up with his back to goal and defending against centre halves, challenge for the ball in the air, chasing channels. So I think it's just a case of finding a balance with what we've got or potentially just going back to Hogan and Duke and just having that more focal point there and hoping that it pays off. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one thing, Tyler Roberts doesn't look like he's a lot of older in a four. But, um, yeah, the, it's just a case of Mowbray and Venus and Cole sort of just finding a solution somewhere with the options that he's got available now. Uh, brings us on to our next one. Uh, at Sam Holton 4, um, I suspect this might be the one that gets you off your long run up, Ryan, maybe. Um, I know in hindsight it's a wonderful thing, but was Kevin Long that desperate to leave or was that a mistake that essentially could relegate us? If so, I make that two huge errors of judgment. Uh, with Long and Rooney uh, that could be sending us to League One, who is accountable for these errors. Um, 
Ryan, is this is this the one that's going to have you off your long run up? Well, let's be honest with Kevin. I mean, obviously, we've kind of half discussed him, haven't we? We, long, we don't know the full situation. It could be that he just got a great opportunity and just went, no, nah, I'm out of there. The fact that he had his place at the start of the season, then lost his place, then got brought back in, then lost his place again, he's probably just gone, I've had enough. I want to go play football and live in the sunshine. Mm. Um, so the club probably felt like they were in a position just to say, let him go. With regards to who's countable, I think you have to look at the football instruction, the people that have made the changes, the people that ran the recruitment in the summer. So we know, or well, I believe it's common knowledge anyway, that you know Eustace wasn't the person making the recruitment decisions in the summer. It was Craig Gardner and um, Frank McParland, and players are sort of passed on. Um, Eustace made the most of what he had. I think a lot of the players came in from the middle of July onwards, and I don't know whether that was a case of the ownership not coming in, therefore not being able to sort of make decisions until the ownership had officially all been signed up and therefore bringing players afterwards um but most of the players arrived you know most of the way through pre-season most haven't had a pre-season a lot of them have got injury records of the young lads so we haven't replaced the likes of again when you're looking at voices in the dressing room you're looking at troy you're looking at um friend you're looking at dean um i know colin was probably less of a voice but he's you know was one of the most consistent players in the division for a long time just in terms of availability and his versatility so I think when you look back at all the decisions that were made, then the decision to obviously remove Eustace, bring in Rooney, and then obviously panic and sort of get rid of Rooney and bring in Mowbray. Um, I think you have to look at those at the top of the club. So you're looking at Craig Gardner and you're looking at um, Gary Cook and those two. If we do go down, which hopefully we don't, or when they look back on this season and go, what went wrong? I think it has to be Craig Gardner and Gary Cook that are the two that you look at and go, you've got either... I don't want to say someone loses their job, but you know, those are the two that have got to be held accountable, and those are the two that you've got to look at and go right. What's the best structure moving forward? That was that was the long run up question, wasn't it? Yeah, excellent. Um, Maxime Trickett, uh, what's the best midfield pairing, if indeed it is a pairing for Blues going into the last stretch of, of the season? Does it change now that we are in a relegation scrap? Peck and Dazelle seemed ideal. But, um, but after Borough, it seemed like we needed more bite in midfield from Sunjic, or or is there a three with JJ the answer? Um, I suppose, from my point of view, I felt this squad was supposed to be 4 2 3 1 when it, when it was recruited. Um, I'm thinking that now I possibly, I, I think you could get an interesting wrinkle with a 4 3 3. Um, because what that would do is it would it would allow Blues to play Dembele either side of a, of a central striker, um, whoever that is, if it, um, or, or even a false nine or something like that. And then you've got loads of contenders, Miyoshi or Roberts on the right. I think the, the midfield three would you, you'd have plenty of flexibility there. Yes, you could play you could play JJ along alongside Peck and, and Sunjic or Peck and Dazelle. Um, so for me. Just a case of, I, I want to see Dembele back in the side, I suppose. And I'm not saying build build the team around Dembele, but I think if you are going to play Dembele, then you do need to make a compromise in midfield. And and a 4 3 3 might be a way of doing that. Ryan, Blue's best midfield combination. It almost feels like you're going to have to chop and change, depending on the game now. It's yeah. we're kind of past the. You knew four by the start of the season, you had Ruddy in goal, you had Sanderson along in front, and then Sonny can barely confront them. And if you had to change, you had to change. I think now it almost depends on the game or just where the players step up and perform consistently. I mean, Sonny had a brilliant game on um, on Saturday. I think his role was simplified a little bit and he had a brilliant game. But are we going to see that game in, game out for the rest of the season? No, in Sonny, probably not. Can we rely on Pike to sort of step up and play eight games? And I think we've got five games in about two weeks, haven't we, or something like that coming up. Um, can you rely on Pike to sort of step up and perform to the top level in each of those games? Probably not because he's new to the country and so on. So I think you are just looking at, you probably are going to have to look at it individually on each game and decide what the best option is going to be. Um, the big issue I've got with the 4 3 3 is just, again, who you play up from? Do you put yeah. Hogan up there? Do you put Stansfield up there? Who do you sort of leave up there? I think when we saw how isolated Stansfield was alongside Pritchard on. Um, Tuesday, Tuesday against Borough. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, do you want to sort of leave him even more isolated on his own or 
to maybe bring the wingers inside to buy as a narrow front three have we got the full backs and the width to be able to do that i think again the you're looking at the imbalance of the squad again aren't you all, all roads lead back to to sort of disparate parts not not fitting into the the, the new jigsaw the jigsaw was fine when uh, when Eustace was was putting it together and and it was that big picture and everyone fitted in reasonably well but the you know obviously that that the the, the landscape has changed since then Joe do you see a a midfield combo that that's that leaps out at you as, as the right one for blues uh, I would agree with you actually I think I think there's a, a for me right now where blues are with the options that they have and they do have if nothing else an abundance of options at the moment certainly when everybody's fit i would be siding with a with a 4-3-3 formation going forwards i think if you've got somebody like dembele play on the left or, or the right of the front three that takes away a little bit of the defensive responsibility for him i think if you've got a three of dozel peg james uh, bakuna three of three of any of those i mean Bielik especially i think i think it, when Bielik's available then it becomes a, something where you can maybe look at a four-two-three-one, because then you've got a little bit more license, I think, with you, with with the creative talents. If he has a Dazelle, for example, someone like that alongside him, then you could play a Pritchard or a James or a Bakuna in front of those two, those two kind of holding midfielders. I think at this moment in time, I would I would be opting for a, a six and two eight, um, and having someone maybe maybe a, maybe a trio at this moment in time like Pate, James and and Dazelle, um going forward. Certainly until Bielik comes back, uh, and I think. There should still be enough in the in in the front line, really. I know Blues haven't been blessed with goal scorers. Um, I, I think Scott Hogan's hit ten or eleven, hasn't he, in the last couple of years? Um, and other than that, the top scorer, you know, there haven't really been anybody since since Shea Adams. I, I know Duke, he had one very good season, um, and there's been so much responsibility on Stansfield's shoulders this season. Um, and Ho Hogan, I suppose, that in that sense, Blues have missed Hogan's. Um, contribution in the final third over the course of this season so i don't know has he got one last hurrah in him leading the line certainly in the absence of duke and and you know if, if that means freeing stansfield up to play a little bit wider in, in a role that suits him a little bit more is that to kind of chop and change even further or could hogan genuinely make a little bit of an impact in, in what could be you know these last few games that he plays for blues Scott Hogan hat trick on the final day of the season against Norwich to keep Blues up. I will sign up for that now. Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll chuck one more out there. Obviously, George Hall's kind of half made a comeback, and I know we've got to be careful with him, but you've got another player there who's got speed and can yeah. finish, and you wonder whether there might be a big role for him sort of coming once we get past the international break as well. Whether we find yeah. a role for him just to, again, be that sort of player that you look to and go, he might score mm. a goal for us. Our first yeah. big thing is he just finding players that are going to score a goal. I think what we've got to avoid is the Tuesday is the Borough selection where it was, it was a team that lacked pace and, was, and and lacked physicality and it was just a bit ploddy, wasn't it? And and yeah. and, and and that that's one of the contributing factors to what was a really poor performance. Um, don't want to spend too much on this type on this one, but it, it is worth just a mention. Um, Joe Watson, twenty four. Do we think the recruitment has been naive? It's clear we've gone for flair instead of solid championship players. This league either needs serious quality um, or tough as nails battlers. Um, mm -hmm. rec the recruit. I mean, obviously, everything leads back to the recruitment, doesn't it? I, I think the the attempt to bring in slight more technical ability uh, in in this in the summer was was ex was well me well intentioned, and I applauded it when they were bringing guys guys like um, Tyler Roberts and Ethan Laird. Uh, in, into the into the club, I thought I thought that was good. What I would say is, it's Blues' position, isn't it? You you, they, they weren't in a place where they could go out and pay top dollar for technical ability that didn't have a didn't have question marks around um, the propensity to get injured. You know, you you don't get. I don't think Blues get Ethan Laird if he has a, a three year track record of forty six games a season. Um, I, so it, it was well intentioned, but Blues were compromised because of, of the, the finance they had available to them to bring those better players in. But I mean, Blues have got to get away from 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 re-signing the you know the the what some commentators call the blood and snots kind of players that 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 have stood them 
instead for for the, the last few seasons you, you know those those players have always been the answer to the the problem they've created just done enough to keep to keep blues in, in in a division and the desire for Knighthead to create a different team and a different you know a more attractive side I get that and I applaud them for that and hopefully this summer if, if they can make a meaningful step forward uh, in that direction Ryan we haven't got a huge amount of time do you want to add anything any more to that point yeah I just think um you know I'm same as you when we started seeing the signings rolling during the summer you know it was exciting and we were genuinely sort of thrilled to have a lot of them in I probably you know we can always look with hindsight can't we and this way you hope your club can kind of sit there and have that hindsight in place I think if you're going to go down the route of making wholesale changes with regards to the squad with regards to um, the playing style and stuff like that you need players that you can rely on to help build that style um, we hope that Alan Pritchard may provide that for Mowbray during um, January with a couple of others but ultimately when you look for the start of the season most of them never had a pre-season most of them got some sort of track record of injuries or not playing full seasons or not having you know a huge amount of appearances under the belt and I just think um, again I suppose to Bobby Farris moves that perfect storm isn't it of every time you kind of think you're taking one step forward you take another step back and this is where you, know, you need your leaders at the club to have a direction and know exactly what the plan is and um, the best way of moving forward and I don't really think we've had that clarity throughout the, conf- you know, the full season brings us on to our last uh question um from i'm not sure this is this guy's real name chris p bacon <laughs> um thanks for joining us chris uh do you think we need a bit more transparency about tony mowbray's position as we as we've had very little update i'm just going to take this one guys if that's okay i'm not sure transparency is is the key issue here i think clarity is is the key issue so as as long as people within the bubble at henley uh, in Arden, know what's happening. That that's fine. Now that might be the case. There might be that clarity. Um, again, I, I I think clarity is more important than transparency. Yeah. I don't think Tony Mowbray's medical medical information is is necessarily a a, a subject for public debate or public interest. Uh, but I do think that there does does need to be a bit of clarity. Uh, Chris has gone on to ask you uh, if we don't. If he's not back before the season's end, do we push to replace him uh, and to res- rescue the season? It's a difficult situation, Chris says, and that's exactly what it is, which is a situation where he's currently find himself in, in a position in the championship. Uh, they've got a few days off in this international break, and then it's uh, it all resumes uh, on a week on Saturday. Uh, sorry, it's a Friday night game, isn't it? A week on Friday away at QPR on March 29th. So, Joe, thank you for joining us. Ryan, thank you for your time again. Uh, thank everybody for listening uh, to what's been quite a long episode. Uh, you've got two weeks to listen to, to this one on the international break, so take your time. Um, please sign up and subscribe or leave a comment And if you're watching on YouTube. As I say, thanks again for your interest and keep right on.